All right. All right, so what is SAS? Um, basically, SAS is an extension of CSS, and it allows you to do fancier things with CSS um, than you're able to do with straight CSS. And we'll show you some examples of these things. They include nesting, uh, variables. Chris is going to spend a lot of time talking about mix-ins, which are where the real fun of SAS lies. Um, although for me, the you know simply just being able to declare a couple of key variables is is so wonderful that that's most of where I live. Math equations, you can actually run math equations in your style sheets. That's pretty cool. Um, no and, word problems though, so you can't ask for <laughs> two trains feeding. <laughs> And, and there's a whole lot more, most of which we won't be getting to today because this isn't an advanced session. Um, we're going to be talking about SCSS, not SASS, because that's pretty much where everything is right now. SCSS looks a lot like CSS itself. I'm going to show you some, some differences. Um, but really the key, when and now that you're thinking about SAS, um, I like to equate the excitement that I feel about SAS with the excitement that I felt when CSS came into being. How many of you were actually building websites when, C when style sheets became a reality and you got to take your formatting out of your HTML files? Wasn't that awesome? C uh, SAS kind of takes you, it, it gives you that step again, which is pretty cool because um, you know, so much is happening and it's such a, a core thing. Um, so just taking a, a quick look at uh, the difference between CSS, SCSS, and SASS. We're going to uh, take a look at these. And I know it's quite small, so I apologize for that. But hopefully you can kind of see what's happening here. We're going to show you some real examples in some code soon. Um, but if you look at the difference here, uh, standard CSS, you've got, you know, your, your classes there, you've got, you know, your border color, and then you have your color in there, you have your color with the color that's there, and then, you know, you have to re-declare border color down here again in the border, even though it's the same color that you've already declared previously. As CSS, you'll see that the uh, markup looks pretty much the same um, for the most part as CSS. So you don't really have to learn something entirely new. What's new here are those two lines at the top, which are variables. And we're going to show some real examples of those. So you can just create a couple of variables. And then you can recall those variables later on in, in your actual style. And yes, there's more code written here. But it makes it so much easier if you ever want to change the blue that you're using, for example. You just change blue up where you declare the variable. You don't have to find that instance in all of your style sheets everywhere. SAS basically is the precursor to SCSS. It looks pretty similar to SCSS, but you don't have. It's just using indentation to delineate what belongs to what. So you don't have the little brackets and, and things that you're, semicolons, stuff that you're familiar with with CSS. The nice thing about SCSS is that a CSS style sheet, whatever you have on your themes right now, is a valid SCSS sheet. It may not be using all the coolness that SCSS gives you, but it's a valid SCSS sheet so you can quickly turn your project into an, an, a SAS project without having to change the way that anything's written. So that's quite nice, quite a relief. Um, there's a, a um, yes, that's a good point. <laughs> Does that give you anything different than if you just type it through set and remove those brackets? You could do that, um, but is there a reason to? Between the two uh, formatting styles? No. Uh, really, one is legacy, so SAS, S-A-S-S, -S -S, the indentation, that's just the legacy first version of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, I guess, uh, a couple of things. For uh, easy compliance and teaching, by going to the bracket and semicolon style, now everybody literally can just move up and create SCSS pages, sheets, uh, and not feel like that, that, that they're losing something, you know? Because legibility, I mean, we're used to the semicolon kind of format. Uh, so that is just the newer format. And a lot of the projects, it, it's funny, I'm noticing a split some are doing only the indented style, 
kind of um, uh, for implementation. But I noticed all the gems, all the plugins that are coming, not just Compass only, uh, Compass plugins, but all SAS plugins are all doing SCSS or both. So you're safe to be in the SCSS realm. You know, in a, in a way, I'll be honest, if somebody chooses to go to the opposite, that must be somebody who's a decider for uh, um, company, uh, you know, uh, standards, you know, coding standards between departments. Otherwise, honestly, everything is going, S everything is SCSS from what I've been exposed to. Um, and so they're really, she, she showed both, but everybody could just move forward with SCSS and not, and it is still SAS. All these, both of these formats are known as SAS script, mm -hmm. all of them. So it's just really a formatting style. And I think uh, um, for legibility, my preference has been SCSS, um, even though I know some people, the Ruby world loves SAS and less. And mm -hmm. the, you know, a lot of people who are hardcore Ruby, they like to do small code, short code. You know, that's, that's a prideful thing that they get to do uh, in their language. Uh, and I think that carries over why that's why they're very much on less of this SCSS realm for their implementation and more the other way. Um, but that's kind of a, um, that's a whole, you know, a different religion, you know, a different reason kind of thing. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to articulate it. I'm just horrible today. So, thank, you, thank you. I hope lunch was good. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's a URL here that will be repeated later on in the slides. Um, SASLang.com. It's a great place to start and get familiar with, with SAS. Um, so really oh, just to... Sorry, oh, one last thing. If you ever need to switch between the two... Don't ever think you have to do it in your code, like manually. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, uh, the command line interpreter, the, the software for SAS and Compass, can switch between both. It literally can remove all that markup and all that in, you know stuff, or it can actually go to the old SAS version. So you can toggle with that software. Why you would want to toggle back and forth consistently, that would probably be you know no good reason to do that. Uh, but if somebody handed you maybe a SAS file and you want to go SCSS or the reverse, that's mm -hmm. how you could do it. Sorry. No, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so we're going to move on to a little bit of a live demo to show some of the um, some of the things that you can do with SAS. And later on, we'll come back and we'll show you how to set up a project to use SAS. So we're not going to forget that kind of key step, but we'll just show you some of the great things that SAS can do very easily here. In, oops. I, all right, there we go. Okay, so this is, um, let's actually go, I closed Chrome. While she's getting Chrome open, quick question. How many people have actually worked on a project and then somebody comes up and they tell you to change a color and you use that color all over the place? <laughs> How many here? Oh, good, right. Okay, yeah. so that's a good number of people. Yeah. Um, so yeah. right away, I think even just the first demo and example that Rain's going to cover right now is going to save right. you the extra hair pulling. Yeah, hopefully. Right. Hopefully. Okay, so what this is, this is actually a style tile that I have for a client that we're currently doing a theme for, um, although I slightly modified it to make it not specific to them anymore. Um, so this style tile, all the style sheets, uh, or the one style sheet is a SAS style sheet, and um, but it, it um, has some kind of old CSS lingering in it, which is why I'm showing it, because it's... It's good to kind of realize that if you have your stuff in CSS right now, it's okay. You can kind of slowly move it over into SAS. You don't have to kind of jump and make it all SAS right out the gate because it, it all works together. So this particular style sheet, if you're familiar with um, if you're familiar with CSS, this looks fairly classic, something that you're pretty used to. And um, if we drop down here, for example, you know, I have H2 block title right here. And then, but up here, I have an H2 tag. And one of the great things about, uh, about SAS is nesting. Um, and those could have been nested. It's just standard CSS will, you know, give them their own distinct um, sections. But if you're going to do SAS, you could actually nest them and make it a little bit cleaner. And we're going to show that in a, in a moment. Uh, but the key here is that this is kind of your, your standard, there's a lot of standard CSS in here, and that's completely fine. Um, the other thing that this particular style sheet shows is right up here at the top, and this is one of the fun things about SAS, um, right up here at the top is this import base. And what we have is 
in my SAS directory here, hopefully you can see that on the side, I have a base.scss file. And if I open that up, these are, these are some basically um, focus more on the media queries up at the top. These are just some variables that I've declared that I'm importing into this style sheet, um, into this SCSS file. So it's two separate, two separate CSS or SCSS files, the base, which just declares these, and then the tile, which says, hey, bring this in. Now, typically, you might also declare any of your other variables in that base file. Here, I haven't because this is a style tile. For those of you who are familiar with style tiles, you might be presenting three or four or five, and they're going to have different colors. So the, these variables, in this case, are specific to this tile, not to all of the tiles as a whole. Um, so import can be very helpful. You know, sometimes your style sheets get so huge and overwhelming. You have you know, thousands of lines in your style sheet, and when you're trying to find something, you, you can't. So this is a nice way you can actually break out your sheets into individual sheets. And base is one that you're basically always going to have with a SAS project. But you could have uh, you know, views. You could have blocks. You could, you could go to whatever length you want to to break them out and keep things nice and clean. So this really helps with keeping you organized. Um, Have you ever had to add a style and it's kind of, you're a little conflicted, you're like, it's in the header, but it's in navigation, and you're yeah. kind of wondering where in the long ass style sheet file you want to put that guy in, right? You know, yeah. you're looking for that. Uh, because you can modularize the code, you can break things up easier. Um, even though we had, you know, importing and, you know, uh, including in regular CSS, uh, this is much smarter. So now you, there are actually newer community standards that help us already kind of pre-answer the organization of a lot of these files because we will start to get a lot of files and they could be really small or they could be, you know, kind of medium, uh, but they never should be really large anymore. But th that's a benefit because then we can manage little, little bits. But uh, now knowing and kind of seeing where a lot of the communities uh, at large are actually now organizing these pieces, we can all now jump project to project and be literally introduced to a new project in a new team. And as long as they're following the community standards, I'll know where to put my new styles because there'll be a place for them. You know, I, I think there's been a time a lot of us kind of spend that half minute conflicted of like, where really do I want to put this? Well, I'll be honest, it doesn't really freaking matter because we're going to do a find and replace later. I mean, it's, it's ugly when it's one long sheet. Um, so that's been one of the biggest things that I've walked away with. Uh, even for me personally, maybe I am not always working with a team, but I know following these standards bit to bit, I can jump in or have somebody else jump in and do quality you know, changes and not really kind of muck it all up. And I think that, that we've run into that a lot with CSS, I think. Um, even if you are breaking up your CSS, you're still kind of appending, appending, appending. Yeah. Uh, so one of, the, one of the just coolest things about SAS, it's such a simple, basic thing, but one of the coolest things are these variables. So you see here that I have seven colors set up, and those are basically the seven colors for the site. When we start talking about math, I'll also start talking about why that's so particularly awesome. Um, and then the font stacks. You know, you might have six or seven different font stacks that you use for different elements on your site, depending on how complex your site is. Um, so you can declare these variables, and then when you get down into your actual, um, you know, your, your actual rules here, you don't need to specify the color again. You just pull that particular variable or you pull that particular font stack depending on what it is that you want at the, in that particular space. Um, here's an example of math, again, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. So, um, so that's, that's incredibly useful. One of the things to understand about SAS is that your HTML files are still looking for CSS files. They're not looking for your SCSS file. Um, so if we actually go to tile six here and look at what it's calling, it's not calling my SCSS file. It's actually looking for a CSS file. And I compile that SCSS file um, into the CSS file, which happens automatically. And we're going to demo that as well. And it automatically creates this CSS file right here 
which is what the site is looking at. And this particular one is minimized, which is great for production. You're not going to edit this, so it doesn't need to look good. Um, but you can also change the way that it looks. But you'll notice that this has turned this into real CSS. It's not using the variables anymore. It's not calling in an imported style sheet. Everything is in this one CSS file that, that's needed. So you're not dealing with includes in your style sheets. You're not dealing with um, you know random variables or anything like that. It's all purely readable as is. And so um, so that's what you're getting when you when you work with the style sheet. So um, if we look at if we look at these colors here, um, if we go back to this, you know, color um, Color 3, C3, is this green color right here. I can just very quickly change that to red, and it'll change everywhere where this green color is, which um, will actually change a different one that has more places. We'll change the blue, because that has more spots throughout. So before I do that, though, I actually need to be able to compile this. And we're going to come back to this, but I'm going to type this critical... <laughs> I can't spell. Um, I'm going to type a critical command in here. Again, we're going to come back to how you set this up, but this is just compass watch. So I'm telling, this is my project right here, and I'm telling compass that it needs to watch this particular um, project. project. Thank you. It needs to watch this particular project for any changes and then recompile CSS files. So right now it's just looking for changes. It's telling me that it's looking for anything that's changed. So now I'll go back to that style sheet or the CSS file and I'll change, what did I say I wanted to change? The blue, which is the fifth color there. So I'm going to change color five and I'm just going to turn it red. And I'm going to save that. I'm looking at this and now it tells me it's just overwritten style sheet six dot CSS. So it's created a new version of that. And if I go back here and reload, uh-oh, there we go. <laughs> so now everything that was blue has changed to red. And it was that easy. I didn't have to go through and find every instance of some version of red, which is where we get into the math. One of the nice things when you're theming is you choose a, a color palette. You choose five, four, five, six colors. And then when you have gradients, for example, you go from one shade of that color to another shade of that color. So it typically in CSS, now you're figuring out what shade one is and shade two is so that you, you know, you're actually making those choices. You're going through somebody's Photoshop file or something and, and trying to figure that out. In this case, you can just say, I want a darker version of red and I want a lighter version of red. I don't know if you can tell that that download button has a gradient in it. And that's actually coming from math related to that particular color. So if we look at, um, so you know, here we have level one style, this, this green right here. So if we go back over to this sheet and we look at this right here, color underscore C3, there's two ways I can handle this. I can say, well, I want it to be lighter. So I'll just add um, you know, a certain amount of, of gray to it. This should make it fairly light. So this is you know, something that you're fairly used to, just standard CSS right there. And then if we go back over to this and reload, um, now that, I don't know if you can tell on the monitor, but that's significantly lighter than it was before. Can you actually tell with that? Okay, good. Um, so that's pretty easy. Then the other way that you can approach this, which is quite nice, is uh, we're going to do, I had made some choices. So you can use darken. And then maybe we'll darken it by 20%. So you don't have to figure out new colors for this. You just, now it's much darker. So you just put in the, the math right there. And you can do this with font sizes. 
You can do this with um, border size. You can do this with pretty much anything that has some kind of a number associated with it. And it'll work automatically, which is quite nice. Um, so another really great thing, actually, before I continue, any questions at this point? No? Losing I people? I have a question re yeah. regarding the, the compiler. What, you did something in the terminal? So. Right. So this is Compass. I've just told Compass, and we're going to talk about Compass again a little bit later. Um, but SAS and Compass, it's really the way they kind of work together. You, you want them to work together. Yeah, because you're, well, again, you're compiling, or uh, some people might know the term as uh, you're, you're uh, flattening or rendering down a static version of the CSS taken from your SCSS file. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was mentioning that the browser, we're still going to point to a CSS file for that to load. Um, you don't want to point to an SCSS file. It's not that that browsers don't understand it. Newer browsers are starting to. Uh, but it's a performance thing. You don't want to, uh, you know, render and compile a style sheet. You want to do it once, mm -hmm. and then just everybody get that same style sheet. You know, so this is why it's a production thing, a development thing. And when you are going to deploy at the end, that's why you got to kind of run that compiler and then just let it do its thing. And you got your files, and those that's kind of what you push up. Mm -hmm. So, so is Compass something that you have to download? Or yes. Yeah, we'll yeah. show that gonna, at the we're end. We're going to get into yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Um, so the, the next really nice thing about SAS is what's called nesting. And um, so here's just an example of something that's, there's actually lots of examples in here, but this is one that um, I can pull up. So you'll see what's happening here. It's a little bit different from standard CSS. In standard CSS, you had, you'd have read more, A, and then you'd have the stuff that you wanted for that. And then you would have a new line that said read more a colon hover and then whatever you wanted that was different in the hover state. But in this case what we've basically done is we said you know read more a and then here's all the stuff and then nested inside of that is the hover information with this weird little ampersand which says this is you know connect basically it's putting it right up against the A there. What I could also have done, you know, this could be even more nested than it is right now. So, you know, we could put A in there and then, so now we can have stuff for read more. You know, I'm just formatting this a little bit differently so that you can see it more clearly. Everybody's familiar with uh, CSS specificity, right? You do a long chain to get to the children. Um, well, instead of having to write out that specificity chain in full length each time, uh, we're using nesting that will then compile down to to be a specific chain automatically. Right, right. So um, this, you know, in this case, this is a very specific instance. But picture how this can work in your views, which can be really nice because views have so many classes in them. So this can really, or in your header region, you know, whatever you might want to do in your header or your footer region, this can get to be very, very useful. But the other interesting thing is what I've just done to this, I haven't changed what's going to happen in the CSS at all here. I've just made the formatting a little bit more sassy than it was before. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and save this, and we're going to go back to that compiler and I want you to notice that it now tells me, it noticed that I just did a save to the file, but no changes were made to the CSS. So the CSS file is identical, as opposed to before when it was overwriting those CSS files, which can be really neat. So if, I see a confused face maybe, right? Am I reading your face wrong? No? No confusion? Okay, let's pretend he was confused. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, because again, no, she's right though. This is something a little bit, you know, uh, a little clarity. Uh, every time it says overwrite, it literally was generating a new CSS file. Mm -hmm. This last time, it created a new CSS file, or it was going to, but when it checked and noticed her, her, uh, her new declarations, her new style, her new levels of nesting, there really was no change in the final output. That CSS final output, there was no change, even though she did a pretty you know, big change in her SAS. But it was really more for the maintenance and the formatting, mm -hmm. right? It's for the developer and the production. So you'll see that 
Okay. And again, one of the biggest problems I've run into myself personally, because I'm going hundred miles an hour is I'll make my changes. I'm refreshing the browser five times. I'm like, my changes don't show. Oh, I forgot literally to compile my yeah. change out. Okay. So that's yeah. like the biggest problem you're going to run into yeah. after installing. And we'll make sure to talk about that on, yeah. when we talk about install as well. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's very true. So, okay. So going back to our style sheet here, um, the other thing that I wanted to show, which is pretty, pretty nice, um, you'll see that these comments look a little bit different from CSS comments that you're used to. Your typical CSS comment looks like this. Right? So these two, these two comment styles are meaningful in SAS. The first one with the double slash means this is a comment that I want as a maintainer of this particular file. It's informational to me in my SAS file, but I do not want it in my code. The second one, the typical CSS comment with the little stars, that one will be output into your CSS file. So it will exist in there. So if we go now and look at style six, um, Somewhere, we should be able to see that comment. But I, yeah, it's in there somewhere. The double um, slash is where you can put all your dirty secrets because it literally will not output. It right. will just, it'll clear that. It'll not put that in your CSS. But the old school, the CSS style comments will mm -hmm. actually carry over into your CSS. So that can be really nice for housekeeping, for maintaining your, your projects and, uh, and keeping them easy. If I could share so, a dirty little trick. Go for it. So uh, I have people that come over and tell me to change a color, and I roll my eyes. And then when I'm done rolling my eyes, I actually will do the work. But the double slash comment, even though the CSS comment you know, is probably good enough, it won't apply that color change. Sometimes, because I'll, I'll know maybe the person is a little fickle, so I'll literally just duplicate my rules, make the changes, but I'll use the double slash comment so it won't parse those out at all. Like they'll literally stay in my SCSS and they'll never appear in the CSS. And the funny thing is I use, me personally, I use that so when I come back and I'm getting rid of the changes that they did not like after they asked for them, uh, I'm really just deleting those, those duplicate lines, if you will. And then uncommenting those kind of double slashes. It's a little dirty trick for me. Like I, I mean, I, you know, I feel dirty when I do it, but I'm happy that I came back and I go, oh, I clearly know which ones I meant to comment out in CSS versus literally scrub out, you know, from the output. You know, I do that a lot also when I'm doing style tiles because with style tiles, you're relying a lot on copy and paste, or you might want to be changing things live, or maybe you're showing somebody something and you want to. It, it just Having that stuff there yeah. lingering, it doesn't hurt for performance because a style tile is never a, perform a production environment. Um, so it, it's just nice to have. You could also use it. Remember I mentioned like my dirty secrets, I put them with a the double <laughs> slash. You could actually take that and really apply it to your own internal processes, documentation, your own internal secrets. So your own templates, you could have all those comments in there and it literally could be proprietary. And anything that's outputted, the final CSS, will never, nobody would be any wiser that you guys had anything, you know, more organizational or heavily documented um, because you could use those two different styles of comments. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, is it only single line or can you do uh... No, you can keep going. Uh, it's double slash every line. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, oh, it, okay. you don't want to do like your life story, <laughs> but like maybe like a tweet, you know, works. Uh, we had another question on the right. No? Somewhere? Is that just an elbow? Yeah, I think that's an elbow. <laughs> okay. So takeaways from what we just showed, um, it's it, SAS really makes it easy to keep style sheets clean by using at import and by using things like nesting. It helps with really keeping stuff nice and clean. Variables can save you a lot of time throughout your, your work. The math helps you stick to a consistent color palette without having to figure out a billion different versions of your color. And then the comments are really helpful with documentation. Um, variables that everyone should basically use in any SAS project to save you time, colors and font stacks. Um, if your site uses breakpoints, then you know breakpoints as well. Those 
would be would be helpful to use. And even if you just did colors as yeah. your literally like a, your yeah. whole first year of SAS, I promise you are going to love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people that you work with when they get on that boat too, everyone's gonna be like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, really, I mean it's 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 a new thing. And it's <laughs> and it's not a fad. It, it, this is real. Yeah. This is a thing, I guess. Is a thing. It's about. it's yeah. the next big thing. Um <laughs> so um all right, so we looked a little bit at compiling with Compass, so we don't really need to go back to that. We are going to come back to actually showing you how to set up Compass, so don't worry about that for now. And um, But we did show that. There's one other thing to show you, though, with the compiling, which is when we looked at the style sheets that were created, you know, this, uh, where did it go? This is pretty overwhelming. It's um, small. It's small. It's That's great good. for production. But if you want to, you know, have a style sheet that you can actually read, then you might want to compile it in a slightly different way. Or a more traditional way. In a more traditional way. So I'm going to cancel my watching here. I just used Control C, and now it's SAS is no a Compass is no longer watching my changes, which means if I make a change, it won't actually compile, and then if I refresh, I'll get stuck and I won't see my changes. Um, but now what I'm going to do, I actually wrote cheats for me so that I don't type something crazy right here. Um, I'm just going to do compass compile. I'll put style. So I'm telling compass right now that I want an expanded version of my style sheet. So now it's going to overwrite all my style sheets. And if I go back here, and go to style. Okay, it just reloaded for me. So now it looks more like something that you would have written. It's just a CSS file. There's yeah. Rain, would you have ever calculated 0.33 EMs for a margin? No. Okay. <laughs> Probably <neither>. not. <laughs> uh, tell me, you had a question. It might not be. Well, I, it raises a question earlier is that comment that you talked about showed up there, but I guess because you only commented. Right. Does the compilation of CSS files optimize in any way? Does it reorder stuff from the SAS file, the CSS file? It's going to go in the order that it's. To a, right? de to to a, a degree. degree. Yeah. Because you can get, um, uh, you can reference other right. styles, or like, right. uh, like she showed the ampersand means parent, the most right. immediate parent. You know, mm -hmm. it's like uh, append this, copy that style. That you know, it's, um, selector and, and append it or do whatever I want with it. When you start to get a little tricky, uh, like instead of creating a parent class and then nesting, I actually will do child classes, and then you can reference the parents, and it will automatically break out when it compiles, and it'll put that parent up for whatever it needs to do to be valid. It will do it. Okay, that's why honestly, at some point, I just was like, "You're smarter than me. Make my CSS." Thank you. Yeah. Right. But it doesn't code it on its own? I don't get that. That's me. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, so I, I won't take time to show you the others because Chris has some really cool stuff to talk about and we want to get to installing and setting up. So I'll just tell you that the others, I showed expanded, but there's also nested, compact, and compressed. And um, nested is the default. It's it's kind of human friendly, but it's also, you know, it's expanded, but it's it's also a little bit cleaner. Compact is you know where many of you probably write your styles. You know each class is on one line, and all the stuff is right How there. How many write one all line. their styles on one line? I used to do that. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's all. <laughs> all right, um, and then compressed you saw, which is minimized, which is what you want to use for production, which is quite nice. Um, so after Chris talks about the really fun stuff, we'll talk about the housekeeping, installing, setting up a project to use it. And um, I separated installing SAS and installing Compass onto two separate lines, which is silly because that's actually one install. It's really easy. But that's coming up. Now for Chris's stuff, which is the fun stuff. And let's get to your question, first slide. Yes. One more question about the compressor. Yeah, so it sees it sees the CSS files. SAS just creates CSS files like you would have created yourself. 
So Drupal doesn't really know the difference. Drupal just sees the CSS files that it's supposed to be looking at. So the, the Drupal compression is bringing all of your 1,852 style sheets. Yeah, into... Drupal is more of an aggregation <laughs> than compression. Right. It's compressing to one file, but it's really aggregating to one file. And then, and then it, you have to do an additional step or two, depending on your own needs, to actually compress that aggregated singular file. Um, what uh, what SAS gives you is it could do ag not only the aggregation, but it can also do different forms of compression. You know, like literally, you saw there was comments, right? You point out the comments, Tommy. Uh, I can actually have no comments output. There is a setting for Compass when you compile the final CSS, do it in the certain way I want it, and even maybe get rid of every single comment. You know, you could do you know, stuff like that. You know, it's a Swiss Army knife of settings. You know, for um, output. Yeah. So, More questions on the basics, variables, sassiness, which I think a lot of us have. Okay. <laughs> Ready for the fun stuff? Should right, we switch? switch right? Yeah. Okay, so my portion is going to be mix ins and compass. So uh, uh, the foundation range setup is very important. Uh, the understanding that uh, we are working in a more dynamic version of CSS and we export or comp uh, compile a uh, static version of CSS. And she showed you variables and those are really, really great. And she gave you good, good examples. Actually, the, the first option that probably really sell everybody, which is colors from the get go and then fonts, you know, and, and standards of sizes and different things like that. Uh, th those are the immediate wins that you gain. Uh, by switching over to SAS, guaranteed. Literally, the, the, I mean, the, by the next hour, you're happy uh, by kind of adopting that, and you know, feel good and powerful. Uh, then the next step from variables is when you start to get a little fancy. So uh, I end up uh, having kind of these cool little recipes uh, for my rounded corners of a button. You know, it's a certain recipe for a style. You know, to give me that look, uh, and maybe it might be all CSS driven entirely, which is a goal. Um, uh, it would be actually uh, a, a little bit too much work to try to break that up into a bunch of little variables for me to then shove in and reuse, you know. I, I have to remember maybe more than one variable together. Or I could try to make a long string uh, as a variable, which are all the styles. And that can work as a variable, but really there's a better feature built into SAS that lets us do these recipes, these snippets, if you will, and reuse those over and over, very much like a variable you know, for a little bit, you know, a little piece of information. And those are called mix-ins, okay? Uh, SAS has functions, literally some mathematical function, like give me tangent, cosine, you know, all that stuff. So there are functions, uh, but there are also uh, these uh, other one, uh, these other uh, similar looking to functions, but they're really just these kind of uh, snippets uh, called mix-ins, as I'm showing you in a very basic example here. Um, the easy thing is, is you get to define the name of this kind of snippet, and then you get to use it all over the place. Now, the snippet's a little bit different. You'll see I'm actually defining actual lines of styles. I'm coming up with, you know, the, the styling, and I'm giving it a nickname called My Custom Mixin, um, and I can format it in any way whatsoever. It really doesn't matter. Again, it's like a recipe, a snippet. And I'm going to use the mixin that I created called My Custom Mixin later on in any element or, you know, any number of elements. And I have to use the at include sign. So it's, uh, there is a, this uh, little bit of syntax that you have to learn, which is at mixin and at include. Um, but I'll be honest, when you're reusing it and you're applying the style over and over again, it becomes like second nature. I mean, you're a fish in water at that point, you know, using them over and over again. Here's one of the funny things. As powerful as this feature is, SAS comes with zero mix-ins. Why? Because SAS is only really just, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a foundation, right? But it doesn't want to imply or come up with a bunch of styles that maybe nobody will use. So they give you, SAS developers, SAS themers, the ability to create your own mix-ins and just come up with your own stuff, like variables. Um, so here's some useful ones that I come up with. Rain showed you that she actually uses variables to put her font stacks in. I use mixins. The reason why I do that is because the font family, it won't be just the, the, uh, the string of text or the font name. I may have these other styles I need to associate like font weight. How many here are adopting web fonts now? Okay, everybody who didn't raise your hand, that is the thing your clients are going to be demanding of you throughout the rest of this year 
and over the next couple of years. Web fonts, web fonts, web fonts. They're easier to use and SAS actually kind of makes it a little bit really trivial once you kind of just get your feet wet, okay? But with web fonts, certain ones, a bold or a book or a light, they have different font weights, okay? We want those defined. So a variable, like for just hip web font or, you know, the word uh, pragmatica condensed, a variable makes sense for just that little phrase. But when I'm actually doing it as a stack, this is the type of stack I want to do. So again, SAS comes with no mix-ins. So these are the mix-ins I end up defining. Look at my naming convention. These are some that uh, some of them you might want to steal. Change them however you want. But I use font, and then I use the words primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay. Um, you can whatever standards you guys come up with yourself amongst your team members, stick to them. Okay. You'll see. You, you'll see. I'm kind of a little bit uh, abstract in my naming, a little bit, but not, nothing too wild. Okay. You don't want to over architect your SAS because then it just doesn't make it fun and. It's one of the most fun parts, right? You know. Uh, okay, so here's uh, me mixing together a mixin and a variable. So we saw variables earlier, and when you saw me talk about mixin, can they be used together? Hell yeah, of course. So we have the uh, the, the the font color uh, as a variable, and that is color hyphen primary. Again, I'm, I have these kind of naming conventions, so when people are just at least glancing at the the SAS styles, they can kind of assume what I'm you know what I mean. Um, and where the placement of those uh, variables are probably going to end up um, within the file structure. But right here I use, I have a variable declared at the top. You saw my mixin, which is font primary. But notice, in the mixin, I do not use the color. That's on purpose. Because color can change. The font may not. But they also both can change, and they can change independently. And I don't feel like I'm polluting the font stack with a color. And you're going to see this a lot. A lot of people, like a lot of new frameworks and plugins, uh, the new movement for object-oriented CSS is not putting any color. And, you know, not making, uh, they call them opinionated styles when it has color or something like that. Right, because, you know, really, good taste is subjective, right? You know, something like that. So what I do is, in the element, I have, that's where I merge together the color with the font stack. Does that make sense to some people? Any question? Why I separate that? You use the variable Yes, 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 I um, totally, totally can. Now, the order that they come in, because, it's, again, it's going to be a kind of top-down sort of process. You want to be careful about the order, because sometimes something might be out of whack. But as long as you have your includes right, you'll be fine. Okay. So. Compass. So we ta talked a lot about SAS, and we made references and mention of Compass, and Rain even showed you the Compass watch uh, in command in, uh, in her terminal. Well, what is Compass? So uh, one of the creators, or actually I think it was like the third or fourth person who got involved with SAS, actually helped build and finish SAS, but they also worked on Compass, the first framework, the first SAS framework. Well, what is it? It's really just a big collection of functions and mixins built on top of SAS. Okay? So when I'm working in Compass, when I'm using Compass, I'm using SAS. It's like SAS++. Okay? It's like a bunch of modules added to my Drupal site. Right, a bunch of add-ons to my Apache, to my PHP. That's what really it is. It's this whole backpack of stuff that I get to bring with me. Uh, and what's really, really cool is it supports plugins. So the new wave, the new movement, has been actually developing plugins for Compass since Compass encapsulates SAS entirely. Okay, you could do SAS plugins, but really where the big money is at is coming out is uh, actually working on uh, new Compass plugins because things are shifting up towards Compass. Okay, so let me show you some example. So remember, I had to create the mixins because SAS came with none. These are the, some of the best ones that I've seen Compass have. Border radius. How many here have clients that design rounded corners on buttons? All right. No more sliding doors. No more weird slicing shit. Nothing. Okay. That whole gradient, the bezel, and the rounded corner, CSS3 does it all. So I get all of it inside my compass, literally border radius. I could tell the top corner, the bottom corner. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up a page. These are the styles. You guys see all those? Yeah, really? Okay, go. Cool. Okay. Better? But I mean, look at the control I get now. And this is all CSS3 driven. But I didn't have to write all the hard long code for Opera, WebKit, you know, Firefox, IE specific stuff, all of that is encapsulated already in the background of the mixin. In fact, if I scroll down, 
we could see on the left is the HTML and the right is the SCSS. So watch, border radius right here, 25 pixel. Oh, so, sorry. 25 pixel, right? That basically means, because there's one value, that means all four corners round out at 25 pixels. I am in love with compass. I like SAS. I love compass. Okay. All right. Let me go back to the next bit. Uh, board race. Did that seem valuable? Did that seem cool? All right. Cool. Uh, box shadow does exactly what you're assuming. It's actually drop shadows even around the whole box. So a drop shadow is really just an, you know, angled uh, offset shadow, but really just general shadows. No more. Don't add your shadow in Photoshop or don't slice it anymore. In fact, that's what I do is I, I work with the designer and I go through their Photoshop layer effects and I take the exact values, the color, the, you know, the offset, all that stuff. And I go and I put it in my compass style. And when I change their slicer, they're like, you're, you're not getting the shadow. And I just smack them in the hand. <laughs> Don't go away. And then they ask me questions. How do you do that? And then I teach them, you know, I show them and then they just love it. So, question. Yes. Yeah. Where is the values stored for that? Uh, where are the values stored for that function? I'm not totally clear. Uh, basically, where can I go and see like, how it's rendering and how that Oh, okay. So uh, we see the SCSS syntax, right? So uh, here's actually, uh, where is it? Here's box shadow. You're including it, where is it being pulled from? Okay, you're, okay, where is it being pulled from? Compass. When compass is added and used in your project, you have basically all the things available to you that Compass can do. Am I able to go and see like, how they're doing that? Because I can follow the items in my source either or library. You want to see the source? Exactly. Okay. Uh, you can actually get to the source of the mix -ins. Yes. Um, and what you can do is you can actually, uh, the technical term is overload. Uh, you can actually overwrite. You can kind of have, my version is the new default, you know, of Box Shadow. So you can kind of take over that stuff if you really wanted to. Uh, there re there's really very little need because all they're doing is a lot of dynamic parsing that is doing the vendor specific, like WebKit, Moz for Mozilla. They're really just doing a lot of that cobbling together because there isn't, um, there isn't any JavaScript or markup introduced. So they're not adding a bunch of extra stuff that we might want to uh, purge or reduce. They're really, I mean, they're really specific to just the vendor prefixes and then the actual styles. So uh, they're really just encapsulating a lot of that for us. But because, again, there is no presentation, no markup, uh, they're pretty safe. But yes, you can totally go to the source. You can edit it. You can overwrite it. Was that a question or just scratching ahead? OK. Both? All right. Uh, text shadow, I don't think I need to cover that. OK. Uh, OK. Uh, scale and rotate. Uh, literally, actually, CSS has uh, a rotation now. So you can even animate a rotation. So now I can basically rotate an object pretty quickly here through CSS. Uh, anybody ever get that little kind of that little tilt for a photo? You know, you want to do an old Polaroid look. Yeah, you can pull it off kind of through CSS right there. Uh, transformations, you can do some pretty wicked stuff. Uh, I like that. Uh, here's a visual model to give you guys an idea. So SAS is like the nucleus of Compass. Okay, C uh, Compass is that uh, that more complex organism. That's what we want to eat. That's what we want to cultivate. You know, <coughs> some of the awesome utilities, though, that I couldn't get into uh, are around uh, like um, uh, content um, columns in text. You know, uh, the print industry and newspapers have been using this forever. You know, columns of text in desktop publishing. Now we can actually pull that off without any janky weirdness. So now we get full columns in CSS3. But that's a CSS3 thing. So I don't have to go learn CSS3 to pull it off. I just basically use the mix-in that, you know, the, the Compass has provided me to create multi-column very easily. Uh, uh, list links, there's actually some really neat things. Uh, so Rain was showing you how she added a hover pseudo class and an active pseudo class to a link. Uh, if you really like to get kind of deep into it and uh, uh, kind of write a lot less code, uh, there are functions that literally will auto-generate every pseudo class valid for an object and do all this magic. So there's really cool stuff. Uh, images and the utilities for uh, colors and sprites. Sprites are a huge deal. How many here have uh, heard of image sprites? 
right? Okay, so for those that haven't used it and those that ha don't know about what they are is instead of 100 uh, images on the page all being a unique file, you can merge them into one PNG file and the CSS can actually know where to render just that little bit. What happens is now the server has only requested one big PNG file with all the icons for your whole website. Google does this, Yahoo, everybody does this for performance. Uh, and now we don't have to do any programming whatsoever to map that and understand that. You literally can have a folder, and I cover this in my session to, uh, tomorrow. Uh, you literally have a folder, and Compass will literally merge all the images in a folder into one big sprite image. Uh, and it's actually, it, it does it faster than what it took me to explain it. Uh, so it's really, really effective. Um, anyway, sprites, colors. So she showed you like the darken, you know, there's a lot of that type of stuff. Uh, so doing uh, complementary colors, uh, analogous, uh, monochromatic, all that stuff uh, uh, is uh, you're able to do. Uh, one last thing real quick before I take off, there's also a way to debug your stuff. So uh, if you have Firefox and Firebug, there is a plugin called FireSass. I suggest you definitely pick that up. That's where, even though it's a compiled, flattened CSS file at the end, you're able to debug and see the exact line of where it is in your SAS. So it's something you turn off when you're done, but while you're developing, it's the lifesaver. Okay. All right. Question. Do you have anything for Chrome? Yeah, for uh, Fire, uh, for SAS debugging? Yeah. Somebody mentioned there was. I did not, pers I didn't go for it myself. But I wouldn't be surprised, seriously, because there has been a lot of um, parity between plugins for this type of development between Chrome and Firefox. Somebody had to have ported it over. And if not, maybe that's the one moment you use Firebug over Chrome. Right. Yeah. Um, so the, I know. I the know. question for the recording is, is there anything for Chrome? Um, and, that, and then you heard the answer. So we only have 10 eight minutes left. The good news is that we're part of the next presentation, so we can go right up because we're already set up for that. Um, but uh, so, so we'll probably do that. <laughs> um, but we'll do this pretty quickly. So installing SAS and Compass, what you'll really, I, I think both of us would just recommend just get them together. Don't start with just SAS. Do SAS and Compass together and, um, and it'll be a lifesaver. So it's actually really pretty easy, but here's the URL that, and um, I'll put up the URL at the end as well, the, the URL that you can go to for step-by-step -step instructions, including if you have problems where to go. Uh, but basically, it's super simple. You just open up your terminal or whatever other command line tool you use. Um, if Ruby is already on your system, then you just type gem install compass and let it do its thing. It'll, it'll tell you that it's installing the different things that are needed. Um, the sudo's there because if you're on Mac OS X or Linux, you'll probably need to sudo that. You do need to have Ruby installed. If you're on Mac OS X, you'll have it. If you're on Windows, you might need to install it, and that URL shows you how to do that. So that just happens on your command line, and then it's on your computer. I was actually going to demo it on an, I had another user account so that I could actually just demo it because I could demo it as quickly as I can explain it or faster. But, um, but it's because it's there for everyone, the other user account already has Compass installed, so I, I couldn't demo it. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> so it's really as easy as this command line says it is. I promise because I'll be honest, like when I first ventured in, I was like, I need Ruby on my machine also. I think, I'll be honest, it's, it's, you know, click, click, install nowadays. Again, Mac does come with it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm that guy that makes sure it's like the newest version. It, it, it is so much easier today than it was, I would even say, maybe up to two years ago, kind of getting that valid, you know, working on your machine. Mm -hmm. There is one point, though, Ruby on Windows. Uh, actually, I was just in a conversation a couple hours back. Somebody had mentioned that I guess one of the last couple versions of Ruby installer for Windows broke and doesn't work well. So if you had tried once on a Windows machine and you just weren't getting anywhere with it, please give it another shot again, uh, you know, you know, when you get back to work or whatever. Uh, give it another shot, I was told, but you might have been in that, that pool of just bad versions. Mm -hmm. So um, if, you're, if you have a Drupal theme, go ahead and come in and sit down. Um, we're, we're really going right up to the next presentation since we're two of the people in the next presentation. Um, 
But um, so if you're adding SAS to a theme, to a Drupal theme that doesn't currently have SAS uh, as part of that theme, Omega 3 is a good example. Um, it's really quite easy. And there's, there's a node on Drupal if you just search for, you know, adding SAS to my theme. Um, you'll get to a node that will give you the step-by-step, -step, but it's basically, I've just pulled up the theme file, so I've just gone in my terminal, I've gone to that particular theme directory, and all I need to do, if I type correctly, um, and you can use copy and paste, so, uh, you know, I just told, okay, now it says congratulations, your Compass project has been created, this is an existing theme. Now, it's, now it has SAS in it. Um, many Drupal themes, the CSS file is, is um, in the CSS directory is called CSS, not style sheets. By default, this config.rb file that was just created, this one right here, by default that'll, that'll point the, um, the SAS project to a style sheets directory, so you'll need to edit that and tell it to look, at, um, to look for styles. So I'm going to just go in there, right here, CSS directory. I'll just change that to CSS and save that. And basically that's it. I now have, I, I you know, you can start, well, okay, now it doesn't like it because I haven't done the rest of the stuff. Um, but I could do that later. I just want to make sure that we finish up in time for questions. Uh, but basically, it's ready to go. It's, it just has a couple more steps, and all of those steps are outlined in on a node on Drupal.org. So it's pretty easy to do. Um, don't be afraid of it at all. Just kind of start and get going, and and it'll be really worth your while. And again, um, she just showed you that she basically had <coughs> lit up her static theme to be a Compass SAS theme. So the mm -hmm. theme was already there. It had style sheets that were done the old way. She has now enabled Compass within the theme. Okay, so now she'll get to do that. Now remember we told you your SCSS files are the same syntax as your CSS. So now what she could do is literally just rename all her CSS files as SCSS. Mm -hmm. And now she can start taking advantage fully, you know, of all the variables and mix-ins and everything. So that's why she was saying very much earlier, you can go toe by toe and adopt this over time in little bits that you're comfortable with at your own pace. It is very, very true. And you know, every little bit you do is going to, you know, power you up a whole next other level. You know, I promise. Yeah. Um, so the next presentation here is a panel on responsive themes. We have a number of panelists who are about to come up. Those of you who are here for the panel, go ahead and start coming up, and we can start taking questions while the panelists are getting settled. Hi. Questions on SAS? Um, you might want to bring a chair. So, Compass? First in regards to the uh, command line that you type in to mm -hmm. convert your CSS to, to SAS for, for the... Uh, so that's the, actually why it wasn't compiling, because I had... You actually have to copy your CSS files into that SAS folder and right. then name the extension .css <laughs> so that it knows that they're where, there. Where do we get the list of commands? Um, that's on the drupal.org just just search for I, I would recommend that you search for your specific theme but there's a lot of documentation on drupal.org for how to convert your specific theme and it'll give you those commands and, we're also and the compass uh, web page has the command list for yeah. the compass command line yeah, yeah. and um, we'll also post these slides and so what we typed uh, this video will be in there what we typed will also go into that posting as well yeah yes Okay, the Yeah, there's a there's a Compass there's a Compass Drupal module um which one, yeah. I haven't used, have you? Those Okay, so those I would stay away from those because they're not necessarily needed for development. They're more for on the fly compiling. You know. Right, right. If you want customers to be able to recompile their own CSS within their own Drupal website, you would use those modules. Uh, yeah, from a performance standpoint, it's it, you don't want to do that at all. Like if you were Acquia uh, Drupal Gardens, 
That would make sense. They're kind of they have that theme builder and editor, but they're not on the live site. They're kind of in a little stasis, and then they make their changes, and then you want to save and compile those changes at the end. That's those are used for something bigger like that. They're not for development. Yeah. They'll only slow your site down if you try to run a site with it. Do not run a site with it. It doesn't make sense. Question. Does it work with Mac? Uh, Without any crazy reconfiguration. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Ruby is the only crazy thing that in the equation that is added. That's a new thing. And once you have a successful Ruby install and you got your compass installed, yeah. the gem, you're good to go. Awesome. Yeah. Chris, the last one. Did you mention all the dependencies that you have to install on the server to be implemented? Uh, so if you ran one of those modules on a production site, for so a module. Oh, on a production site? Well, yeah, so, why so would you do that? that you well, no, that's what, but that was the question. <laughs> oh, the, oh, okay. Those models for okay. the files. Right. Um, right. So, so the point is, you have a lot more set up. More, yeah. more complicated and, and but more to maintain on the server. As Mike is saying, don't do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't, yeah. Uh, this is for local development. Yeah. Um, so it's time for us to move on to the next session. Um, I think we have one more panelist. And uh, oh, <laughs> thank you. All done questions, anybody? Last 